We are now in the last month of the year 2023. December was not always the last month. If you see this in the name Deca, which is 10, it used to be the 10th month. Then later became the last in the Gregorian calendar of the 15th century. And you see the last always has that compelling force to make us think of whatever final activities we need to do. Just imagine in a basketball game that is tight in scores and the Barker announces last two minutes, then you can see the sudden alertness of the players. The trailing team is going to do its last-ditch effort to rally while the team ahead is going to do everything to defend its advantage. Well, that is the compelling force of being in the last I want to provoke your thought this first Sunday of the last month to think of an inevitable last. I do not intend to make it a gloomy thought, but try as we might, it is not something we can avoid. You and I are going to face the last day on earth. If we are not caught by the second coming of the Lord Jesus, then we shall uh, see eternity by way of living our last day on earth. Imagine what it would be like. For most, actually, they would not even know that it is going to be their last day. They have not thought of it, much less prepared for what follows one's last day on earth. And remember, I'm talking only of your last day on earth, because the last day on earth is your last day in time, What follows is eternity. And the question, are you prepared, is not just prepared to die and that you may be a practical man having prepared everything having to do with dying, but it is what follows that which we need to ask, are we prepared? And we will use a story that Jesus himself tells, which is about the last day of someone who does not know so. It is a familiar parable, but familiarity often breeds indifference. But it really is one of the most sobering. And I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 12, this familiar parable of verses 13 to 21. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have, made amp- you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That is the inspired word of God. Biblical literature has bequeathed to us the title for this parable as the parable of the rich fool. <clears throat> it was precipitated by two brothers in dispute of their inheritance. It was not really unusual for people of that conflict to consult a rabbi. A rabbi, after all, was considered an expert in the law, and he would be able to adjudicate matters of legal questions. But this is not an ordinary rabbi that this brother consulted. This is the Lord Jesus, and he is not the usual rabbi because his teaching is not the usual teaching of the rabbis. Instead of adjudicating their conflict, Jesus delivered a stern warning. It is his way of teaching about his kingdom. You misunderstand the kingdom or the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ if you even think that it is about wealth 
or it is about delivering to you the property that is due to you. Behind the dispute on this wealth, Jesus sees the root of the sin. And the sin at issue is covetousness. Itong pag-aaway ng magkaka- dalawang magkapatid ay hindi lamang para sa kanilang mamanahin sa likuran nito ay ang pagkasakim. Ito ang binubunyag ng ating Panginoong Heso Kristo. And so, up the Lord Jesus is seeing in this man, consulting him, something that defines his life and that defines the life of many. Covetousness. Now, it may not be covetousness for you, but anything equal to it, which is a definition of life that is earthly. If you define your life only in terms of investment on earth, whether in money, property, fame, or career, or anything of that sort, you have misunderstood the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe like this brother, you have your life defined by something of this earth. It may not be money, but something else, but the message is unchanged. And the message is that you have no share in the kingdom if you define life just as an earthly investment. And to highlight the value of those things that people define their life by, Jesus reveals the last day of this man. And what makes this parable sobering, it is one of those very rare uh, circumstances in parables where... God himself speaks. In most parables, it's just the ordinary life that Jesus will portray. But in this parable, he includes God speaking in that parable. And what is the point? Well, the message is this. God determines the last day of life on earth, requiring preparedness anytime. Ang Diyos ang nagtatakda ng huling araw mo sa mundo na kumakailangang maging handa anumang sandali. God determines the last day of life on earth, requiring preparedness anytime. The initial portrayal of the man in the parable is one who will earn the accolade by many as a successful man. I mean, who would not want to be in the place of this man? Just change the ancient settings with more modern settings, and you would want to be like this man. In place of the harvest and barns, you probably may think of money in the bank, or promotion in your career, or something of fame in your field of vocation. And you may then say you have reached the top. You have reached success, and everybody can recognize it. This is that sort of a man. He is successful from any measure of this earth. Perhaps it is like you in many ways. It is your own measure of your life that you have reached or about to reach the zenith of success in terms of money, in terms of fame, in terms of career, in terms of whatever it is that makes life what this man plans to do. Relax, be happy, enjoy your life. But as I've said, it is in that parable where Jesus includes God in a very rare way because God himself has something to say. It is going to be this night. I will require your soul. Two things that will uh, remind us concerning the folly of investing one's life on earth when you do not think of the last day. First, God determines every individual end. Ang Diyos ang nagtatakda ng katapusan ng bawat isa. God determines every individual end and the second is death releases merely temporary worth ang kamatayan ang kumakalas 
sa lahat ng pansamantala lamang na halaga. Death releases merely temporary worth. So the first thing that Jesus wants to get across first to these brothers in conflict about inheritance and to for look to his readers and to all of us is that God determines every individual end. Although not mentioned in the parable, we can assume that this man is still at the prime of his age. After all, his planning includes the words for many years. He is expecting many years to live. I don't have many years, but he simply this man is able to plan many years ahead. And you can see in the character of this man even something that is worth emulating. He is a good planner of the future. He thinks about his future. He has a clear vision of what to do in order to make his life happy and perhaps to earn more. He has everything in place as far as life's investment is concerned. He is not the slothful. You cannot blame him for that. He plans and he determines that he will not be static about his investment. He wants his investment to have more barns to store his harvest in. So he's a young man with many years ahead and a good planner of the future. But what does that tell us? It tells us that even future planning often falls short of preparedness for one's last day. Kahit ang mga pagpaplano para sa kinabukasan ay malimit na kulang sa paghahanda para sa huling araw. Even planning for the future falls short of preparedness for one's last day. The plan of the man covers many years. But one factor that he has not reckoned and he could not is that it was his last day. Jesus lets God speak in the story. And what does God say? Fool. This night your soul is required of you. Now that does not mean to say that God is talking to the man. That does not mean to say that that man could hear what God is saying. It is simply that Jesus is opening up the windows of heaven for us to take a peep at what God is planning for this man this man was a plan for, for many years ahead. This man was a plan for how to enjoy life with many years to come. And God said, no, I have determined that tonight will be your last. And God does not let us in to his secret appointment. But you cannot say that there is no warning. Now, there are plenty of warnings that death can come anytime. That while you are planning ahead for many years, death can come at a moment that you have not planned. There are many who say death is a spoiler. No, it is only that we are deaf to the warnings that are scattered around God's word. That death can come any time. That familiar verse to many of us, Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. It is an appointment, the one appointment you can never delay, nor cancel, nor defer. But when that God has appointed your death, it will come, however, by natural or unnatural means, it will come. On the day of his appointment. And whatever science today and experts of medicine may deem their ability, and you'll read this in many literature today, that they are expecting to achieve first great longevity and then ultimately immortality, that is man's pride to think that it is in his hand to achieve immortality. Listen to the wise man of thousands of years ago in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 8. No one has power to retain the spirit. No one has the power on, in the day of death. That is the inflexible rule of life. Since man has fallen into sin, 
he has started dying. And by any reckoning of statistics, death is still 100%. Take away two from the biblical story. It's still 100%. Everybody dies. Death makes no discrimination. Yes, wealth will buy you the best medical care, but you will still die. The man of the parable is thinking of many years for his happy life. Perhaps he's thinking of five or ten years, and he doesn't know he only has five or ten hours to live. But let me say, even those ten hours, if you ask me, is enough grace for him to repent and to see that the reality of life is not this earth. Not the investment you make of your fame and career and wealth. If he only used the rest of those hours to repent, then he, will have, he would have found welcome in heaven. But obviously, such is the grip of his plan for a happy life that he has no time to think of his last day. This aptly describes many today. Perhaps you are young or relatively young. With a long future ahead. But when is your last day? And your answer most probably is, I don't know and I don't care. Why spoil the happy life now? Why spoil a good plan? And so many are unhappy with a faithful Christian message that forces them to think of their last day in eternity. And so many churches are happy to oblige. People want to hear what is their blessing today. And the message of many churches can be summarized by that promise, God will bless you today. And no matter how you brush off the thought, the day will come. Why? Because God determines it. Not because you're careless, though that may be a factor, but it's not because of what man can do. No matter how you think it is too far away, you do not know what God is saying. Just as this man in the parable does not know what God is saying. God is saying, your soul is required of you. That word required is interesting. It has the sense of ask back. In true benevolence, Jesus taught his disciples in Luke 6.30, if you lend money to those who are in need, do not ask back. That's the same word. But it's not the way God deals with us with our borrowed life he will ask back and he will ask back that soul because he owns it and the fact that we have lived long in this world we tend to often forget that this life i live on earth is but a borrowed life anytime god can ask it back and i have no power over death We do not own this life, nor did we sign a contract for how long we can live. God decides unilaterally. Australia just passed a law, and other countries followed soon, of assisted dying law. They want the patient, the doctor, to decide when he could die at his whatever time he wants. You see, that is, I believe, just an attempt at illusion of control of death. Nobody has control of death. So I challenge you to think of your end and examine your own preparedness for what follows. Isipin mo ang iyong kawakasan at Suriin mo ang iyong kahandaan sa susunod dito. Sapagkat ang kawakasan mo ay hindi kawakasan ng buhay lamang dito sa mundo. Ito ay may susunod. Ang susunod ay ang kawalang hanggan. That is it for which most are not prepared. 
They may even be prepared for death itself as an event. They have arranged as practical people everything for the inheritance of the household, even for their burial. I have my St. Peter's plan, by the way, and that should make it easy for my family. But as Jesus makes clear, there is something that continues after death. Although the emphasis of the parable is is on what is left behind, the teachings of Jesus live without doubt of an eternity to follow. Preparedness for death that reckons with eternity is only by belonging to the kingdom of Christ because that alone will be eternal. When Christ came to die and rise from the dead, he brought eternity with him for his followers so that those who come to believe in Jesus Christ, they already have eternity begun even in this life. But for those who are not his followers... For those who have not come to Christ by faith, you only have this life, but you are ill-prepared for eternity. And the cut-off is your last day. And when you are not ill-prepared for eternity, words beggar me to describe what that is like. It's not about fire or worms or darkness. The horror of that eternity that is for the one without Christ is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 1 as being cast away from the presence of God. And my friend, that is the horror of eternity without Christ. You will spend it in an eternity that is without God. And the Bible can only render it in figures of speech to show the horror of it, of people wailing and gnashing their teeth, of fire and worms that do not die in reference to the incinerator of the city where garbage is thrown. That is what your condition is going to be if you die ill-prepared for eternity. You have done what you could to have all your days on earth to be good and happy and relaxed as this man in the parable has done, but you are ill-prepared for eternity and what you realize is that those things do not matter. If you are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why God tells this man in the parable, fool, what folly to invest All in this life when there is eternity. Do not be blinded by the folly of temporary happiness. It will satisfy only so much. Then the last day. A few days ago, Henry Kissinger died at age 100. He was the most prominent diplomat in the 70s, 1970s. Believe it or not, outside of my Christian books, my most number of books are either by Kissinger or on Kissinger. Because I admire the man. He rose to fame. Its apex was probably when he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for stopping the Vietnam War together with his Vietnamese counterpart and many other achievements. In the 70s, he was even more prominent than his president then, Richard Nixon. But he died. Fame and wealth and achievements have not stopped the last day. And even though he died at a prior at a ripe age of 100 which is too long for many of us he died that's the point God determines every individual end and what does that mean I come to my second point death releases merely temporary worth ang kamatayan ay magkakalas sa pansamantala lamang na halaga. 
The question that in the parable God himself asks, the things you prepared, whose will they be? The question is, of course, rhetorical. Maybe the man has his household to take care of his wealth. Or more likely, as I feel, the answer is to answer the disputing brothers. To this man in the parable may himself be in conflict with his household. And when he departs, a story duplicated many, many times, the children would be in dispute over his wealth. But whatever the things of this world, the things that are only temporary are intended to serve the interest of eternity. There's the secret of how to make your temporary of eternal value. Let it serve the interest of eternity, not just your earthly pleasure and earthly career and earthly fame and earthly wealth. Now far be it from me for me to suggest that your work or vocation on earth is meaningless. Far be it for me to say that you must neglect your vocation in the interest of eternity. On the contrary, you have heard a teaching in this church repeatedly that you need to excel in your earthly work. And there are those who will use their interest in eternity to be sloppy about their temporary jobs. And that is a bad testimony for someone who claims to be prepared for eternity while mediocre and slousy in your earthly vocation. That's not the point you're going to get from this church. But the very reason we excel is when we do them for higher reasons than their earthly worth. And the higher reason is when your temporary is made to serve the cause of eternity. When your money is not just, just used for your personal pleasure and convenience, but for the cause of the kingdom, for benevolence, for helping others, that's using it for eternity. It is the man who has his vision of eternity who will be seeking to excel in whatever earthly work he does in the temporary you are, to, you are taught to do your earthly work for eternity, for the Lord Jesus. Then its worth is more than earthly, but when you invest your whole life in the merely temporary, then its worth will be left behind. The Bible makes that so clear. 1 Timothy 6 verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. That is just so universal in observation. This is the rule of life in the valuation of temporary and eternity. Jesus' kingdom reveals this. In another parable, Jesus portrays the welcome of the faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, the servant does not show anything that he has produced while on earth. It's not about what he has produced that he carries with him. It is about the faithfulness with which he has done that which he was assigned to do on earth. That's what you carry before God. And this applies to believers. And I don't want you to think that being prepared for eternity is only about being a believer sure of going to heaven. 1 John 2.28 makes the warning, Abide in Him so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink in shame at His coming. John is addressing this to believers whom he calls my little children, his special endearment to believers. And yet he warns them that there is a sense in which standing before Christ because of failing to live a life abiding in him 
you will be shrinking in shame for the unfaithfulness with which you live your life while claiming to be a Christian. Last year was the centennial of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, that great pharaoh who has been buried for more than 3,000 years before he was discovered in 1922. And when he was discovered, they discovered with his mummified corpse the gold and wealth of only a pharaoh could have. That was the belief by the Egyptians. When a pharaoh died, you let him have all his wealth to bring to the afterlife, including his wives. But it's still there. It was not carried to the afterlife. That's the folly. That's why God said, fool. Don't you see the folly of living for the temporary that you will live in the grave? My challenge to you is use the temporary in the light of your eternity. Knowing that the cut off is your last day. Gamitin mo ang iyong pansamantala sa liwanag ng iyong pangwalang hanggan at ang Ahati dito ay ang iyong huling araw. Now for believers, their eternity, as I've said, already begun by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The believer now has eternal life. Eternity has begun when you believe in Jesus Christ. It has invaded this age of the temporary. That's why we live for eternity and the temporary things we have in this world, we use for eternity. But the unbeliever does not have that. But let me tell you, the offer is extended to you. You can have eternity now. You can have eternal life now in Jesus Christ. If you will not allow yourself to be in bondage to the temporary, in bondage to wealth, in bondage to earthly investment, realize that there is an eternity to live and to face and when you are in eternity looking back at your time you will find that it is but a speck of dot when compared to the duration of eternity then you too will say that what a folly it was that I lived my best of my life for those temporary things for those things that will not last God is right to say to this man, fool. You're not being asked to give up your temporary worth. On the contrary, it is to optimize it. It can only be so by using your temporary worth for that which is eternity to, eternity to face on your last day. So soon the year 2023 will be over. It is the last month after all. And soon, one's life will have its last day. But no one knows. God is saying it. Will he say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Or will he say on that last day, Fool. Before John Bunyan wrote that famous Pilgrim's Progress of which, with which we are all familiar, he wrote a first allegory which is less familiar but just as impactful when you read. Its title is The Life and Death of Mr. Badman. So this Mr. Badman lived a life that's bad, but also a life with its virtues, 
But what makes it bad is that it's all about earth. And then death came. As it will come to all of us. We just do not know when the last day will be. My prayer is may the Lord give us all long life on earth. But no matter how long, you may live like Kissinger to your 100th. But the last day will still arrive. Because God determines it. The question is, will it prove to be the last day of a fool or the last day of a faithful servant? In response, we will sing the song which is conscious of the borrowed life we live in this world and yet praying that as long as we live in this world we will, ab we will the Lord will abide with us and that we will be conscious that one day we shall see him as one who has known the Lord Jesus and therefore will know no death's thing nor the victory of the grave. As the third verse says, I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears, no bitterness. Where is that sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still, if thou abide with me. What assurance, and that is only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing, abide with me. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, let those words sink in our hearts. These are earth's vain shadows that flee. Those that we think are so secure. The things that make us happy. Or like the man in the parable, planning to relax and have a happy life. Only to confront the reality that it was God who determined that that night his soul will be required. And so it is for each one of us, there will be a day, a night that we do not know when you will require our souls. For one thing we must bear in mind is that we do not own this. You have lent it to us to make use of according to your word and there is no better way to prepare for that last day than to be prepared for eternity. But only Jesus Christ came from eternity and to dwell in this time through his incarnation. And he lived a life of perfection, obeying the law that we could not obey, and then dying its penalty that we should have died. And in him, there is even now eternal life to those who believe in him. We pray for those who have yet to believe in him and are listening to this message. Whatever its imperfections, may they take the substance that it is God who determines their last day. And when the day of death has come, as Ecclesiastes says, no one has power over the day of his death. And we pray that we may be ready. And the only way to be ready is to be ready for eternity. And when we are in eternity, in whatever condition, we will look back to, that, to this shadow of time. And we will indeed consent to God, who said of the man who lived for earthly investment, Fool, what a folly it is that when there is eternity, we suffice ourselves with a shadow of time. Speak powerfully and effectively to those who need to come to Christ that the offer of eternal life is extended to them. May they not in folly choose the shadow of this earthly life and forget about eternity. Make us all ready for the last day 
and that it may be every believer's aspiration that we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, and not the indictment full. May we see that the difference is our response to the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you back the glory and we plead that you may save sinners today for the glory of your Son. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.